All right, so can you guys see the screen, right? Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how data are going to be functioning in the future of engineering. So I'm talking about unreasonable effectiveness, but I want to inform you guys about the fallacies as well, like why you should know about the revolution, but the fallacies at the same time. So, so let's, let's begin, begin with the revolution. revolution. So what's so what exactly is science? Science is, is actually a systematic enterprise. So I, I copied this from, from the Wikipedia, but basically what's more important is that we are building and organizing knowledge in the form of uh, testable explanations and also predictions about the universe. So we can actually simplify science in such a flow diagram from observations of data collections and then we do some theory or modeling and from the theory and modeling we do some predictions and from predictions we go back and see whether it matches our observations of data and then we reduce the cycle right so what is the current state of science now we move already across three stages thousand years ago we are doing experimental sciences so you you see nat uh, natural phenomena, you describe them. And then theoretical science emerge. You have Newton, you have Maxwell, you have all these giants in our history of sciences. And then from all these fundamentals, we move on to computations. So you're starting to simulate a lot of complex phenomena. So this is a visionary slide by Jim Gray. He's the, uh, the CTO of Microsoft, he went missing years ago, unfortunately, during sailing. But he is a very, very visionary that he predicts that 10 years from now, which is 10 years ago, this part was delivered, is that today we're going to do data intensive sciences. So you're going to have a lot of instruments capturing all the data. You're going to generate a lot of data through simulations. You're going to generate a lot of data through sensor networks. And what's more important for scientists is that you have to analyze and mine all this data. You have to visualize them and then you have to actually form a model or you try to form a theory and then you communicate with with other scientists so astronomy has been one of the very first disciplines that is very successful in this realm so now we move next to engineering which is the core of uh, of why we're here today right so who are engineers we engineers we are actually applying all these scientific and empirical evidences and we have to leverage uh, social economic knowledge as well. So we need to do all kinds of things to design, to build and maintain all these different kinds of structures, machines, tools, components, to organizations, etc. I copy this from Wikipedia, but I actually summarize into three important stuff, which is the design, build and maintain. So for now, for the past, uh, century and decades, we are doing a lot of designing and building. We seldom maintain. But the future paradigm is that in addition to designing and building, we, we have a lot of stakes in maintaining because urban city is running out of spaces, right? You know, like uh, in, in our homeland, Kuala Lumpur, maintenance is a huge issue. In Hong Kong, actually, they spend a lot of time maintaining. So what makes engineering fantastic is that when you design it, you incorporate a notion of maintenance into it. And this is why Romans are good at it. Right? Roman engineering, like the hydraulic engineering, are still there today. So this is the future, the real future of engineering, if you want to see next uh, 20 to 30 years. So if we break it down, this is a diagram I draw. You can see that first we have observations or data. And then you can split into two ways, right? You can split into left and right. So you either, you can do with solid scientific theories, you do a lot of modeling, and then you predict. So this is how you do your designs. So you have some uh, fundamental understanding of how beam perform or how a machinery performs like the RPM and all these things. So you predict them and then you design the, the piece of machinery of the systems. And then the other way around is that you do some empirical modeling, right? You have to understand 
uh, or you don't actually can pro project from the theories directly to the design because the system is too complex and you have to do a lot of empirical modeling and then you again you go to the designs and finally that's the key part uh, uh, in our future is that performances will become more and more important because now we actually have to maintain uh, built system we we have fleets of machineries we have fleets of factories available already and everyone is trying to crank out every single efficiency of all these systems so you have the performance issue that this requires a lot of observations and data as well so what is the current state that we are seeing today in engineering now in this revolutionary talk by Isaac, he's i copied from his PPT is that we can summarize um, the past two technical revolutions the first one would be how the steam, electricity, and all this aeronautics was brought into our, our, our world. So Europe starts to dominate the global GDP. But the second technical revolution, we have internet, right? We have transistors, we have computers, we have, we have all these RAMs and hardware and, and storage devices and all. So we start to have the second technical revolution in the US and Japan is dominating for today. But now the emerging third one, which is, which is very re relevant to all of us, is that we are starting to use all these existing infrastructures and computations. So we start, start to fuse them by doing computing, communication, and sensing. So what this does is that you have, uh, for example, you heard of Internet of Things, you heard of smart home environment. So you go into your house, you you turn on, uh, you don't have to turn on the light. The light actually turns on by itself and you can communicate with the system and all the system does is feedbacks from sensing. So what it actually expects to do is it's free people from manual labor and we can actually invest our time in doing some other things that is not uh, actually labor intensive. But we can expect as well the fourth technical revolution is that machines are taking over the world we can upload our mind and our brain through a computer brain communications with the web and that leads to uh, virtual reality or augmented reality in the future. This is something we can expect, right? So now just don't talk about the fourth one. We just talk about currently what we are, we are going to experience. So we, have, we are going to experience the third technical revolutions. So in third technical revolution, we're going we're gonna to predict that abundance is going to happen. So abundance means that we have no hunger. We have medical, medical care for all. We have clean water and air. We have clean energy for everyone. So this is going to happen in 20 years. And the only way to achieve that is through massive, massive environmental sensing. So when we do this, we're gonna do a lot of historical sensor development. We have to, we have to increase the volume we, within these 20 to 30 years. So these abundances, um, Brightech predicts that we're gonna have 45 trillion sensors by in 20 years of time, right? So this is gonna lead us to a lot of exponential organization and IoT is what's gonna happen now, right? And digital health. So currently we are having 7.46 billion world population. So the projected 20 years later would be 8.77 billion. And that summarizes is that we have 5,000 sensors per person. And that's a huge amount already, but you can actually see this coming, right? You already have like 15 sensors in your phone. You have 200 sensors in your car. Now it's, it does not seem very far away, but to achieve two more orders, from tens to hundreds to thousands, that takes a lot of engineering, that takes a lot of computational effort, that takes a lot of new knowledge and how to integrate all this, all this knowledge into and your expertise into, into existing field. And, and by consigning all these knowledges into new fields, you can merge into new ones. So when we look at this Gartner chart, you can see that Software defined anything is becoming very, very important. The reason is because hardware is becoming so cheap 
So we are trying to do, use software to define a lot of this hardware that amplifies a lot of the functions. That's why we have uh, IoT is going very quickly nowadays. And you can see IoT platform is going up the curve. So it's going up to the peak of uh, very high expectations. And you have virtual rea reality actually travels from this to here like for the past 10 decades. So virtual reality is becoming something of a staple nowadays. But what we are seeing is that software define anything that, that actually uh, empowers IoT and also machine learning. All these things are going very, very fast. And in the future, you're gonna see how, how this is gonna change, right? So you can see another one on the rise is smart data discovery. So you're gonna have all these problems facing you because more and more data means you have to discover the context behind. When you talk about context, you can hear there's a, a lot of context brokering as well. So these, these are coming into trades and coming into the uh, banking system. And also you have the brain computer inter interface. If you know about all these new techs that people use the uh, brain waves to you know, move objects in the air around like uh, controlling all the motors and this is gonna be a, a new future, right? So this is what we can see you, you're, gonna, you're gonna come into in the, in the next 20 years to 30 years. So what makes all this possible is that because of the software and the hardware is going so, uh, so platform defined, we have convergence. So you have hardware, software, and telemetry convergence. The hardware and the telemetry, the prices are actually made possible by, by the revolution of mobile technology. The iPhones, uh, the Androids, they make them so cheap. So now we can have this convergence and makes everything so cheap for us to deploy sensors and on almost every single thing. This is what powers Internet of Things. So you're gonna take very, very uh, great care about this, um, these future revolutions. So if we break this down again, the chart that we have before, now you can see that even from scientific theory modeling to empirical modeling, you have data transferring between them. And after you do your modeling or your empirical modeling, you also have data traveling to the design stage and also from the design stage to the performance stages you're feeding data to them so you, you can actually know what's the baseline or the benchmark you're gonna base your performances on. And then it fits back into the loop, right? Everything is, is powered by data. So apparently engineering is moving, moving towards this, this trend that you are seeing profuse flow of data among every single stage from modeling to predictions and designs to performances. So what we can substitute is that in the very beginning, you will have to have some monitoring to know the phenomena that you're gonna face. Like for example, if I am a civil engineer, I am gonna design a structure on top of a soil. So what I need to do is I need to monitor how the soil behaves, right? When I actually try to solidify the foundations, I wanna see whether the foundations is going to subside before I started to build my structural elements above it. So that takes a lot of monitoring efforts. That takes a lot of sensors. When you see the ground is subsiding, like say one millimeter per month, then you base your modeling on the Terzaki theory or something that you can calculate uh, what's the consolidation parameter. And you're gonna fit that data to empirical modeling because you wanna see how in the past people have experiences and gather data about the, the soil profile. So you're gonna have this feeding all around and, and then people start to see, all right, it, it looks good. Like the, the, the foundation can, can actually, you know, sustain 20 levels of load already. So now let's go on to the design. But, but in this stage, you have to gather data as well, right? You have to know which part is subsiding more so you can actually shift the center of gravity of a structure to one side rather than the other so you have uh, differential settlements you, you're not going to take care of you're gonna you're gonna 
<coughs> step your own shoes into these muds, right? And then during the construction itself, you're, you're going to monitor the performances. You always hear that people have all these failing embankments when they are trying to build a building. And this is surprisingly very important. It's becoming more important because in urban areas, when we are building buildings side by side, when you're trying to demolish old buildings and build a new one on top of the old sites, these are very important. You, you got to take care of public safety. You got to take care of all the people around you. So it also incorporates a lot of very sensitive uh, monitoring of all these things. So not just uh, civil engineering, of course, in chemical engineering and in mechanical engineering, in manufacturing, it's the same stuff. You're gonna monitor your fleets of machinery, right? Like how do you optimize your you? You you want to know whether, if for example, someone wants you to produce ten thousand. 100,000 uh, Coca-Cola bottles. So you're gonna monitor all your machineries, how they're gonna, gonna perform while you're doing all these uh, designs that are gonna implement into them. And how it actually, what's the yield, you know, like 80% or 70% what's going wrong during the productions. So everything, uh, we are moving towards this uh, paradigm because of the enabling of the, the power of the internet of things. So, by doing so, we know that for exponential organization, we have uh, all this really, really huge growth, exponential growth in, in two to four years. Now, we just have to summarize into a few stages. Now, first of all, we have all our products or services digitized, right? You're, you're having this already, the information tech. And you have this deceptive phase that, oh, you, the key players are not doing very well, right? Oh, Apple is not selling well, right? No, guys, like PC is not the new paradigm. And then suddenly Apple is doing so good, you, you tell people like, now we have every single PC in your hands. Now these are what we have been going through for the past 20 years, the digitized or deceptive disruptive spaces. But now we are seeing new organizations. What are those like Google, Facebook? These are the, matri the materialized uh, organizations. You, you have your search engine, your, your social network digitized. So you are operating on bits instead of products. Now, the next possible step, of course, would be the demon uh, demonetization, right? So you have these GitHubs distributing free software so people can build on top of open technologies but not just software right physical products are becoming bits as well for example now you have 3d printed products so what are 3d printed products they're actually bits you are digitizing a material so you can actually print them out in any places so you can share all these designs for free as well so it's not just a software, the, the products themselves are becoming more and more dematerialized. And in the course of this, people are sharing the knowledge. So you, you're not going to, to monetize on all these things. All these organizations that monetize on, on products, you're gonna think and rethink your business model in the coming two decades, which at the very end, we need to democratization. Democracy is something that you can decide on yourself what you want. So for example, if I decide that I want to have a bottle today, or I decide that I want a tool today, so I can actually go online and get these bits and then print them out. So the tool and the information are democratized. And one paradigm that writes on this is the ubification, right? Uber is is actually riding on, on this trend. So Uber is actually the transition between, between a, a full-scale democracy of, of technologies transition stage. So you're actually connecting people to existing stuff. And this is what we care about, right, in the next 10 years. But in the 20 years later, you're gonna talk more and more about democracy, all these democratized products. So how are we gonna drive all these explosions? Now, if 
we're, we are actually now at this paradigm one US dollar per sensor. So we having all these smartphones, this is our paradigm for now. But if we drive them one order less, we can have almost every sensor on every single thing from clothing to jewelry. Now, one more order, we can have 3D printed systems. So we can monitor ship packages as well, right? If you drive it one more order down, you should enable a lot of monitoring of agricultural food. So you're monitoring food next. And when you drive one more order down, then you can even actually monitor plant seeds to monitor all the health and nutrients needs of every single plant. So the explosion is one we all should bear in mind, like how this is going to grow. So engineers uh, from electronics uh, engineering and mechanical engineering, you people are going to be responsible for this explosion in the next two decades. So for now, let's do some uh, engineering industries at a glance. So now uh, this is about uh, four years to five years ago, we have global GDP of 70 trillion. Uh, developing economies share 29 trillion while advanced economies share 41 trillion. So down there, the pipeline, you're seeing manufacturing is and still very important. Now, what makes this important is because we are producing a lot of transistors and computing, uh, computing hardware and all. Look at China, China makes its most money out of electronics. But uh, what about Malaysia? Malaysia is doing electronics as well. Thailand is doing electronics as well. Thailand is doing uh, hard disk, if you know what Thailand is doing. Then, as you can see, the major economies are still dominated by man manufacturing because of electronics. So this is going to remain very, very relevant, uh, relevant. So for industrials, what it means is that how you go through all this, all this economy, uh, how you're going to optimize all this flow. So you have transportation, you have logistics embedded inside the industrial uh, the, the opportunities as well. So all these are big big relevant, uh, relevant industries in the coming 20 years. So let's talk about the power 1%. If we can increase the performance of aviation in 1% fuel saving, we save 30 billion US dollars over 15 years. The same stuff, if we can save 1% in oil and gas uh, capital expenditures, we save 90 billion US dollars. But Look at the other fields as well. We have power, we have healthcare, we have railways. 1% is already a lot. You're seeing all these huge savings that potentially can empower poverty. You can solve poverty by saving all these monies by just improving the sectors by 1%. So we ask ourselves as engineers, what is the end game that's going to come? So. Now, these are good examples that, for example, if you look at a single machinery, then this is a vertical stack. Well, across here, you have the horizontal stack. Now, industrial wheels, you can separate into machines, facilities, fleets, and networks. So say that you have a machinery that you built into an airplane. So these are facilities you have. Uh, people serving your airplanes and all, and you have fleets of airplanes, you're going to manage the system. And then you're going to manage a network of the airplanes. Possibly squeeze every single performances out of each of these, right? Similarly with productions like oil and gas production, you can do the same. And for healthcare, you have the MRI systems that you're going to you're going, to you're going to build into hospitals and, and then you're going, to, uh, you're going to optimize the whole operations and you have all this network optimization. So every single part is very, very re relevant. Some involve a whole single player. Some involve different players. Every single player is going to do a lot with data because you're going to optimize watch what's up. Uh, what's in your field, right? If you are doing machines, you're gonna make sure you're gonna optimize every single efficiency. You're gonna see how the machine performs, like how you make it perform much better. 
So the end game is that when you think about this, you're gonna collect more dynamic data, of course, uh, <clears throat> not just static. So dynamic means you're monitoring vibrations. You're monitoring the whole entire activities of your machines. For example, gate analysis. Now Google now knows who you are by looking at your phone because they can analyze how you walk. And he knows that, oh, it's you, no, it's not not the other person. So someone stole your phone and put it in his pocket. So this wisdom is that dynamic data are gonna dominate. So you're not gonna collect data every single five minutes or one minute. You're gonna collect 50 data, 30 data per second. So you can analyze how the changes, you can, you can actually take advantages of how you, how you monitor frequencies and all. And the wisdom number two is that domain knowledge remains very, very important because a lot of people have been talking about, oh, I have a lot of data so I can, I can do statistical modeling and all. But if you look back at this picture, if you want to squeeze efficiencies of every single system, it's not going to happen. Domain knowledge is still very important. So you collect data, but for now, data needs experts and data needs systems and data needs it needs a lot of discovery in the process. So you need people to work on how to discover the data and you need people to use the discovered data and actually fit into some models on, on some existing performances models and try to improve on top of the existing knowledge. So for engineers, domain knowledge remains very, very important. It's gonna become more and more important in the future. So now, we all know about the revolution. Let's follow through the fallacies. So this is a very famous philosopher, Karl Popper. He actually revolutionized how we see sciences. So he says a very important thing. He has a book called The Logic of Scientific Discovery. He talks about one thing only that if you want to make a scientific statement, you must be able to falsify the statement. So if you cannot falsify the statement, you are not speaking of the reality. So you do not say that, uh, you know, uh, everything here is made of uh, matter. So if you say everything is made of matter, then it's very hard to falsify this. But if you can say something like, all right, I say that most of the stuff are made of matter, but for A, especially for this product, let's say water bottle A, it's made of matter that consists of B, C, and D. So people can actually falsify your hypothesis based on your claims. So this is how you build sciences. And this is exactly how we build engineering in the future. Because when you collect data, your hypothesis is gonna be coming in front of all these things. So what, what you're gonna do is you, ma you must make a lot of falsifiable hypotheses about your data, for example, you say that uh, now you're gonna form a hypothesis that when you collect uh, all this vibration data, you're gonna predict uh, from this vibration data, the frequencies that are gonna resonate with your, with your machine. That when you collect the, these, when you see these resonances, it means that your machine is gonna fail, right? So you go ahead and collect, uh, form this hypothesis and you collect all this data and people say, that, no, uh, the resonance is not the thing that signifies how your machine fails. So you go back to, again, form a hypothesis. So this is how you complete the loop. But what's the wisdom is that data is not operating in only spatial domain. It operates in spatial temporal domain, it means time is a very important thing. Data expires. So the wisdom is collect it while you can, but you need to form hypothesis on it. So you collect the data. If you do not have hypothesis, the data remains dumb data. If you do a lot of statistical modeling on it, you're not gonna have, if you do not have a hypothesis on your, on your modeling, then you are still not getting anywhere. So wisdom, collect the data and form hypothesis, test your hypothesis and then recur, right? Now, a very important paradigm in, in today's data modeling is that we are doing a lot of naive Bayesian. So naive Bayesians, 
what it says is that you can, you know, <clears throat> update the posterior probability based on some class and predictor. So what it means is that prior pro probability that you say that something is true before you get the evidence. I, I say that 9-11 uh, is going to hit by a plane. The probability is going to be like 0 0.0001 because that's how the rate of uh, airplane uh, crashing into a tower for the past six years. But when you see the evidence now uh, at eight in the morning, uh, a plane crashes into the, the tower. So you update this, right? And then you have the posterior, then it becomes the next plane gonna hit the 9-11 tower becomes like 90%. So this is very important for, for a lot of modeling. But bear in mind that there's a fallacy in this Bayesian modeling as well. Because Bayes, Thomas Bayes in the 18th century, he's actually a priest. So what he's saying is that um, we, we, if we want to know whether God exists, right, we gonna collect more and more data about God over the time. But there's a fallacy here because if you say that God exists, the prior probability of God exists is one, then the whole Bayesian model fails. And if you say, for example, there is no God, then the prior probability is zero, then the whole model fails as well. Now people guess that Bayes actually knows this. So Laplace and ATAC actually forms that you need to have uh, a probability. So this has to be a probability, it's not a must or a none case scenario. So now you can see again the importance of hypothesis in your modeling, right? Now, people, when people talk about data and how computing power increases over time, people talk about singularity. So now people say that well, computer is getting power, more, more and more powerful. So we have, uh, we have computer these days surprising the, the brain power of, of a mouse now already. And then in 10 to 20 years time, then you can surpass as a human. And finally, it surpasses all the human combined. So people are saying that, oh no, machines are gonna rule the world. Like Elon Musk and Bill Gates are, are preaching about the, the you know, how AI is going to destroy us all. You, you see the outruns in Avengers, right? So that, there's this curve that you can draw if you're based on singularity is that we, when we have some data in the past, we use entire human to process them. And then when machines are invented, we pass some of the processing to the machines. And in the, few, in the, in the future, it's going to be entirely machines. But, Let's look at the scale of data. So this is gigabytes. So 10, the thousands and uh, 100, giga, uh, 100,000 gigabytes and all. We can separate into four domains actually. So for example, you have a local system. So you want to know how a beam performs when you unload it, or you, you want to know how a pendulum swings when you, when you swing, right? So you have known inputs and performances. These are actually small data. Right. Now, before we actually analyze this, please, we are in this domain, unknown inputs and performances. So the scientist operates in this domain in the past. Newton do simple, uh, simple gravitational uh, experiments. So he throws some balls now, he throws some feathers and all. So you collect data, this smaller than 10 gigabytes, you do a human analysis. But when you quantify all these things, inputs and the performances, then you can throw them to the machines to do analysis. Now, because you know the fundamentals of the system, when you project it to a complex one, say that you have a thousand pendulums in this system called a clock, then you start to have something very complex. And if your clock is an atomic scale and it runs on the facility, then you have a lot of data. Then you have to use the theories developed here because you know the inputs and performances. So you're going to simulate them. So now you hear a lot of people doing, oh, what you're doing, I'm doing simulation. So simulation depends on fundamental models that have known inputs and performances, but you do not simply know how it performs when you scale it to a large, large scale, right? So in the future, 
What about unknown inputs and performances and very complex system? For example, what we are doing in, in my research and my team is that we are doing landslides. Landslide is a very complex system. You have a lot of different, different forces operate at different scales. And you do not simply understand how it inputs into the system. You do not know how the slope performs. So you have to collect data and you have to simulate, you have to explore how it performs. So this requires humans and machines. So the fallacy here is that now when we look at this, this, what, this is what the future engineers should know about, right? So you're gonna operate in one of these domains. So you can still have a lot of people doing some local system. For example, people doing quarks, people doing uh, how the basic atoms gonna spin. So these are the hardcore theoretical knowledge. If you are very hardcore, if you have very strong math, if you have very strong physical uh, physics, right? You're gonna stay here. This is your field. And if you do not have a very hardcore knowledge, then you're moving towards here. So you're the guy who is designing a structure. For example, structure is still a very local system, but buildings and buildings are cities is already uh, considered a complex system. But for a local system like buildings, what you need is disciplinary principles. You have to have solid understanding and you use specialized software to design your stuff. But when you move to complex systems, then you suddenly are talking about experience. So you're you are talking about, oh, you're gonna hire a, a old engineer who has uh, 10 years of few experiences in this. And, and he, he actually knows how some of these disciplinary principles operate. So he knows how some system perform over the time. And this guy has some intermediate coding skills as well because he needs to formulate uh, the problems in a new fashion. You cannot actually uh, go point blank. You cannot actually go uh, as a as a blank state into into this uh, modeling of the of the complex system. So you have to have some coding skills. But what about here? Here it means that you need cross disciplinary understanding of all the system. So phenomena means like. Oh, I know that uh, the building is behaving like this when you load this, and the the, the railway is gonna gonna vibrate out of uh, our sink when the earthquake comes. So you have different understanding, and you know that oh, if I gonna put a vibration sensor there, then the coupling of the sensor and the structure is gonna be important because without coupling, then you're measuring something out of phase. And these guys, you're gonna have broad range of coding skills. You're gonna visualize the data you're gonna create the data from from hardware scale you're gonna actually build them throw these models back into uh, basic uh, understandings and uh, fundamental knowledges so you have to deal with different kinds of software different kinds of skills so the four squares here very important in the future would be the this square right but of course in big data, we are actually talking about this scale as well. So majority of engineers are operating in this scale. But people are starting to talk about how you manage fleets of machines, like the, the picture I showed you before that. So you, you're moving from here to here because from a machine to fleets of machines, then you're going to have intermediate coding skills. You're going to know. Uh, some of the past performances and you're going to know how to visualize all the data, right? So the fallacy here is that there is no substitution by machines. When, when a system is local with unknown inputs and performances, we do it entirely in a human domain. And then we completely substitute it with machines when we actually know the inputs and performances. So you have two ways to move this curve around. So the first one is that you move it to here and then slowly because you're moving towards complex system with no inputs and performances. So you're substituting human calculation by machines. So this is how it move, right? So to a really big data paradigm. The other paradigm is that because you do not have the, the complete knowledge of the inputs and performances. So 
machines are actually assisting you on the knowledge discovery. So machines not going to substitute human. So now, as humans, every single human is listening to this. Uh, I expect no machines are listening. Is that uh, machines are going to just assist us if you are doing complex systems with unknown inputs and performances? But if you are doing simulations, if you are doing something like brain production, if you are trying to to say that right now we are we are trying to maximize the yield of uh, rice, uh, so how going to design the, the the machinery, the silos, and how it you make sure the, the silos does not get actually stuck when you're doing all these grains production. So you're going to do calculations by machines. There's a complex uh, called molecular uh, simulations in these scales as well. So in the future, right, I'm sorry. In the future, you're going to do either this or this for, for human engineers. Now, how big a petabyte is? by a lot of data so this is how you see the scales right so you have one petabyte is like 20 millions of filing cabinets filled with taxes and you have all this entire written works of mankind from the beginning of recorded history to have 50 petabytes so you have the sizes of a of a facebook is 1.5 petabytes of 10 billion photos so petabyte is very very, very huge indeed. But again, you the wisdom is to collect as many data as you can and then you form a hypothesis. This is a very, very funny diagram and how da, uh, Facebook is collecting all the data of, of the, uh, the the text people type into the status and they just search for we broke up because and if you do this thing, you see that people actually broke up before Christmas. So people are being fun, uh, being nice to their, their partners. They're not doing this during the Christmas. They they do it. Uh, oh, they do it quite high up here during Valentine's. But after Valentine, people start breaking up again. So the the thing is, data comes first, but hypothesis is very important as well, right? Now we are just in the beginning. Now this is from OpenSensors.io. It's a very uh, huge thing coming. They collect 6 million open data messages a day. And people are already very, very fascinated. And this is the new paradigm that's going to lead how we monitor our machineries and our buildings and, and the performances of every single home environment and all. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes talk about how our team, what our team is doing. So what we are what we have done for the past six years is we have this data enabled scalable instrumentation. We bet on the trend that we are still in the transitions. We are still in the this relatively static era because people are not collecting a lot of data these days. They, they collect uh, five to 10 data per second. And it's already a very huge amount of them. Some people only collect one minute, uh, one data per minute. So what we're betting is on the dynamic paradigm. So we want the instrumentation to be scalable. So we have this paradigm called the data enable scalable research. So we first have to design the sensor in the, in the back end. So we have some scalable data collections. And then from the scalable data collections, we move to big data storages. And from there, we can build a large scale data processing. So from there, you can actually a little bit back, this is what we have built in the past uh, six years. So this is our sensor node with the sensor module. It's actually a MAM space sensor and we have a control module. So our concept is that we are doing continuous, scalable and dynamic data collections. Now we have six channels, accelerometer sampling at 500 Hertz. So you are getting what, uh, 500, data per channel per second. And we have also gyroscopes, we have also temperature sensors. Now we have new additions of GPS sensors that we are collecting at 50 data per second. So the whole concept is that it's collecting dynamic data. And because you are collecting such a huge amount of data, you're gonna make it scalable. And because you're doing it in a continuous fashion, because you do not want to 
you do not want to discontinue your data collection, right? So it's going to be, you're not going to monitor it for like 10 seconds. You're going to monitor it for years. You want to see how this building performs for the, for the next 10 years after you build it. So the whole thing got to be continuous. So it's going to be flexible at its core. If you want to add new sensors, if you want to add new data, you can actually do that very easily. So this is the concepts behind our system. So now what we have is that on the right, you see a very traditional <clears throat> classic, you can say, uh, data collector system that people are using nowadays. This costs 46,000 Hong Kong dollar per piece. But what we have here is that it costs us only 1,000, about 46 times less, but we can do high sampling rate. We can do multiple channels. We can do a lot of, uh, you can alter the sensors you want. You have uh, these storage spaces actually, actually can be built up from the sizes of SD cards you use. You have over the air update. So these are actually very similar in some of the specs, but we are having more because we built on top of the paradigm of IoT. Now, because all thanks to Steve Jobs and Samsung, we have very, very, very cheap computing. All these single board uh, chips are so cheap that we can actually build on top of them. We can merge all these sensors and we can have this uh, engineering done so that it becomes really cheap. At the same time, our system can do GPS uh, collection as well. And this is the, the Leica GPS uh, data collection system has 72 channels and 20 hertz. But what we can do is we can do a lot more satellites and we collect at near 20 seconds, uh, 20 hertz and also some depth reckonings at 500 hertz per second, uh, per se 500 samples per second. So we also have a server farm built up with the latest distributed database uh, processing paradigm, the Apache Cassandra from Facebook and Apache Spark and this is our system. And currently we are actually collecting 5.4 million data per second. And this every single day is equivalent to four days of IBM weather data. So every single day we are collecting about one copy of Wikipedia. This is what our team is doing for now. So you can imagine the, the data amount that we're collecting, the dynamic uh, the dynamic data that we collect so much more nowadays enables us to see how earthquakes actually comes and how the structure actually perform. So because of this, we can move from the paradigms of quantification to prediction. So now this is basically what we are doing, engineers are doing these days, are reactive solutions. So when you see a problem, you quantify it, right? You go and collect data, then this is called reactive solution. And when you can predict them, that's called proactive solution. So you can actually go ahead of time and you tell people that, dear, your airplane machine is going to break down. You know, the vibration is a bit off. So you're going to replace this. So instead of going reactive, you can save a lot of money, save a lot of uh, effort, save a lot of lives by doing proactive solution. But this requires very dynamic monitoring on all the existing machineries, on all the existing airplane more, uh, parts, on the existing parts of the buildings. And when you can do reactive solutions, you can as well, as well do diagnostics, right? So the diagnostics will be on how a machine behaves over time. But if, when you can predict them, then you can do predictive maintenance. This opens up a lot of new areas of businesses. For example, you can do a lot of smart services. You before your HP printer breaks down, because HP printer is collecting accelerometer data of how your printer vibrates during each printing, then they tell you that, hey, uh, Mr. Tan, your, your printer is behaving very strangely. Uh, we, su uh, we suspect that this is a printer head that's, that's wrong. So we're gonna send a guy up tomorrow morning to replace the, the projector head, right? So, when you move into this paradigm, you, you operate at a different scale. You are ahead of a competitor. Your competitors operate at reactive solution scales. People bring their printers to, to the vendors. They say, 
hey, my printer broke down. But instead of that, you're going to have people going up your door saying that now your printer is going to break. I'm here to repair it for you. So imagine the, the avenue of businesses that's going to open up if you do all these quantifications to predictions by enabling your system to collect massive data at massive scales. So we welcome hackers, enthusiasts of hardware tinkers, uh, all of you non conformists or geeks and crazy people, we welcome you to join our team. So you can contact us. My name is Gilang at Gilangwe at usd.hk, or you can contact my partner, Bing Xiang, uh, at tanbingxiang at gmail.com. So from now on, I'm going to take questions. And thank you very much for being here today.